and we can just talk about those practicalities with them when people are, are you know, I mean, not, old, I'm talking about old people, but drug dependency, alcohol dependency people as well, because clearly, I mean, I have to say, I think it's wanting as it is at the moment, that service, and it can only really, if we don't get the grip of it from a fire service point of view, how it affects us, would probably only get worse really as, as time goes on. So could we perhaps look at that as something you know, as a scrutiny committee, it would be interesting as well for us to start bringing people in with expertise and, you know, we can question them <coughs> and see how we can fit in with their services. So we will make that objection, again, so some semblance of reassurance, you know, um, in, in a number of districts we have a, a, a fail protocol in place for people who are discharged from hospital, um, which we would come to that ethnic to our prevention teams to allow them to go and visit the home and to get access to the home and put some, uh, to, to complete the home fire safety check. Um, that's not the same in every district, you know, let me be clear about that, but you know, certainly in, in some districts that's in place and, and it's again something we are seeking to expand on. But just you know, in regards to bringing someone in to talk about the, uh, the discharge protocols and the, you know, the implications around the introduction of the Care Act, I think that would be uh, valuable for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. Check <coughs> I think the committee should um, acknowledge the work that the uniform staff and the support staff have done because the, uh, the stats we've got there are fantastic. Yeah. Seeing you know in the past twelve months what what the changes that's been and um, the results that that's recorded there, the testament to the work <coughs> that we're doing. And I, I think there's a committee yeah it should be acknowledged what they've done. I think I mean. Again, everything is out of cost because I think a lot, the number of them deaths that occurred last year and this year with elderly people, the people that have fire, retardants, bed clothes, and things like that in their houses, they'd still be alive now. And I think it is, it's going to be a cost to the fire service to take that cost on board. That's another question because the cost will go to Well, you know, I, I would say yes, I'd agree. It could be down to cost. But on the other hand, it, it's again, you know, making sure that 100% of the information is shared because people are discharged from hospital. Um, it's fine if they tell us they're discharged, but, you know, I have to say in a number of cases, you know, everyone can recall, you know, an, an incident where people have been discharged, the health service haven't even informed the district nurse team, mm. and only because people have family to help them, you know, get those services in. So there is a breakdown somewhere, and I'm not saying it's all the time, but you know, we, we can deal with things if we know, and I think that, you know, a lot of that really lands on the, um, the doorstep of the health service. Sharon? I think the likes of Leslie and myself, who have lost all of us, seen things <coughs> and what goes on in the hospital. <coughs> a lot of duplication, a lot of people running around not knowing what the other ones do. A lot of so-called academics and I've got no common sense when it comes to people being discharged. And also, a lot of people that actually don't listen to families when families are telling those in charge what they know is best for their elderly parents. So it's a bigger, bigger thing than this, but there's, there's a lot of uh, people who are like headless chickens in the NHS, and you have to think you don't know what they're doing. Any other comments? I was wondering, you know, Jeremy, if you're talking about the discharge <coughs> problem, you know, you're talking about the likes of social care as well. Mm -hmm. Because you, you've got a situation where the hospitals, I mean, I've had people linked in that when the problem was up in where they've been actually sent home in a taxi at 10 o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. Literally, so put, put, literally so put in a taxi and sent home. Because the reason being is because the hospitals have to clear the bed. <laughs> if they if they go if they go over, then in reality they can get fined. The local authorities like a fine uh, hundred pound if, if, if they haven't got a person discharged by a certain time. I think it's it's a good idea what you said about the people from the medical medical side coming in. But I think we need a more broader approach on the solution. <coughs> Obviously, I thought the fire authority must play an important part because at the end of the day. Um, it is only if it's, if it's thought necessary by the actual the staff or the known to social services that they might need the care package. Some of the people we're talking about might not need or have necessity for the care package, but their home 
may not be a good place for them to go to as a, as a person with senility or other problems out of there. So I think it's a much broader picture, and I think it's a good thing that we, that we, that we do need to discuss it. Yeah. Um, I, I was just wondering, members listening to this discussion, whether you would find it helpful for us to try to set up a specific scrutiny committee to so look just at that's working in yeah. partnership with other yeah, agencies so around the health agenda. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. It, it may be a while before we can set it up to yeah. get all the right agencies involved, but perhaps it's, it's just yeah. a single issue meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe it's like best to see yeah. Yeah. what groups have to be here, what people are. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, Is everybody okay to accept that? Major. Okay, move on to the item five, which is on page 103. That's uh, Cheryl, I'll talk through this report and when Kenyon's going us uh, for today, we should move on to some kind of additional questions if anyone has, has some in regards to. Uh, well, it's the Equality and Diversity Action Plan, uh, 1316, quarter three and four, progress report for year two activity um, and the year end. Uh, the person report is to <coughs> provide members with an update on the third quarter and the actions contained within. Uh, and you will recall that the Equality and Diversity Action Plan was first introduced in April 2013 to help and assist Merseyside Farm Rescue Authority to progress its long term equality objectives uh, and monitor progress against that to ensure compliance with the Equalities Act 2010 and the public sector equality duties uh, placed on the authority. Some of the, kind of the, the key areas of performance, the summary of performance against the plan itself, there's a total of um, 44 actions that were, were in place for year two. Um, 32 of which are green and actions have been completed um, and 12 of which, which are under <coughs> activities which are now in progress and being carried across into the forward plan for year 3 for completion. Some of those self evidence as to the reasons why. Um, it's also worthy of mentioning um, a part, part of the equality uh, planning process that we've been successful in, in, in two areas of received due award, two awards. One, from the Asian Fire Rescue Association um, National Fire Rescue Service Award for Positive Action Work, and that links directly into our recruitment strategy. Not only our recruitment strategy for firefighters, but also extends into the recruitment uh, process that we apply for our apprentices that have been brought into the service more recently. Uh, and the second award, which has been mentioned previously, is uh, a matrix award, which is around the standard of youth um, information. It was particularly uh, identified part, part of the reporting process of how well informed young people were through our programmes in respect of uh, quality and diversity and, uh, and how that was re reaffirmed and reinforced throughout the whole of the programme that they undertook and that extended not only from Fire Cadets, <coughs> Three Princes Trust uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the actual update against the, the five <coughs> quality objectives of the year is contained within Appendix 2. But before we get to Appendix 2, we go, there's an opportunity for members to consider uh, Appendix 1, which is the green highlights, the actions that have been undertaken across a number of the functional areas. So you'll see it extends beyond um, you know, prevention, protection, road safety. It also incorporates the work that we do around youth engagement, enforcement and prosecution. Um, there's a reference to, again, I think it's probably important that I would identify this one, in regards to hate crime actions, and again, being referenced certainly by uh, Merseyside Police and Ben during his presentation. But I just saw your, your, your attention to the introduction of the, the safe havens. We formally actuated um, in the past 12 months on 11 occasions. Uh, the reasons being quite important, I think. Two homeless and frightened, one assault and sought refuge, one person in pain with bruising. One vehicle attacked by youth, one person feeling suicidal, okay. one seeking uh, help after hospital discharge, two persons chased by a group, one male lost, one male with uh, sorry, one female with no abode, and one child being hit at home. Um, and so when you look at the kind of thing that that has been an opportunity for that young person, or you know, certainly some of your suicidal tendencies. Being lost and, and not knowing where to go, 
after we introduced the safe havens, has allowed an individual who may not have expressed those concerns in any other way to express some concerns to the fire and rescue service. Um, and it's important that the you know, hit time uh, forms are now integrated as part, part of the safeguard uh, data reporting systems, and more detailed information will come back to the party uh, over the period. And then it goes on to talk about the broad sense of the report, home safety actions, um, talks about our access uh, orders again, just to emphasize one point which I think is, is important. Um, we commenced an access order around our facilities, around our own internal <coughs> staff, so our female firefighters particularly, but also its compliance around the, the, the equality of duty for visitors to those stations as well. Um, and just bring it to your attention that all facilities for female firefighters that were recommended in the access report have now been completed, uh, including additional facilities at the Training and Development Academy. And quotes have been requested for stations requiring priority one to disability access, and that work is in, is in train now, uh, 1560. But I think that's important to again, bring that to your attention. Um, and then, as I say, it continues to consider other actions in relation to health, safety and welfare of staff and also you know, cross-training and operational preparedness and response. Uh, finally, I'll conclude with uh, one observation, if I may, which is around uh, strategy performance. We completed this the staff survey. We are acting on some of that information um, now in regards to you know, the, kind of the uh, polarised views that some staff have within the organisation. Um, but we are in the process of producing that uh, consultation uh, engagement action plan uh, for how, how we undertake and respond to it. The other thing which I, I suppose is just a, a language thing and I, I say to everyone now, so I want to say it to, to you as authority members as well. Um, part part of the, 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 the staff survey, one of the things that came back from our, um, and I'll use the term at this moment in time and I'll we'll address it in a second, from our non-uniformed Green Book staff was the fact that they didn't like to be referred to as non-uniformed green book staff, back office or support services. Um, and so what the language we have now looked to introduce and, you know, and, and continue to reinforce is fire rescue service staff. Because from you know, they are fire rescue service staff and we would just, you know, associate them in, in a non-operational role if we were talking specifically to operational staff or fire rescue service staff in a non-operational role because I think it's probably better language and we would want to uh, instill across the organisation moving forward as well. But that's just something I thought would bring to your attention. Then you go into some of the district highlights, and I won't go through them all, they're, they're, they're vast in, in, in that respect. Um, and the, the report kind of concludes at that point. Um, then just to kind of to come back to page 139, which is the quality objectives and the performance update. Um, if you look at accidental wildfires, you know, you see significant reductions, that is on target and green, and particularly focused on um, accidental wildfires in tenants of properties. Uh, accidental kitchen fires in, in RSL properties is again significantly below the target set. Delivered secondary fires is significantly below uh, the target set, and that links directly into what the work that we do with young people, hence the, uh, the fact that it was a, a quality objective identified to be. Uh, our, our planning processes. Uh, road traffic collisions, again, targeted towards the 16 to 25 age group, hence the reason why there was an inequality in our view there and, and that targeted work. That remains red and is part, part of our conversations up until this point. will be a focus for us moving forward. And then the final quality objective, which we are able to report back on for the first time in probably five years, is our, our recruitment strategy uh, and our aim that we recruit um, in a way which reflects the organisation uh, and the communities that we serve. We've recruited 12 apprentices, uh, seven of whom are male, five of whom are female, ethnicity, you know, white British is 11, and one BME. Our firefighter recruitment, 16 firefighters recruited, started on the 7th of April, uh, and the course will go for 22 weeks, and we'll give them a week off, um, of which 13 are male, um, uh, three are female, Ethnicity 14 British white, one BME, and one prefer not to say. Uh, but again, you know, there have been a point to be made by Jackie previously, you know, a real focus on, on kind of recruiting to reflect the communities of, of Merseyside, and that's the first time we've been able to report back on that particular quality objective. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.
As I got with this right that year, uh, we will have the apprentices come to the, um, the next authority meeting to so meet them all. Uh, we might struggle a little bit with the recruits because clearly the recruits are, are on a recruit uh, program at this moment in time. Um, however, we do intend to have a pass out where they will pass out and the members will be um, invited to attend that particular celebration. But we may equally extend the opportunity for members to come and meet in that particular uh, period during the, the 22 weeks of that uh, program. So uh, that would be, be a great idea for our purposes. Is there any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Can I just add something to what um, Phil's just said about the recruit training? Because this time, what was incorporated into that recruit training was you, um, as an authority, in what you do. And uh, the recruits should all know you by photo and name by now. <laughs> <laughs> We test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if, and if, you if you don't recognise Councillor Gladys, it's time to press Can we so. just say thanks again for the report? It's yeah. Yeah, it's good report. report. Yeah. Okay, Are we okay to look at the report? Can you check that? Yeah. Next item is page 145, agenda item 6. Thanks, Chair. This was a, a, a report which is directly related to, to some areas of scrutiny that were applied by the authority at the last performance and scrutiny committee um, and particularly members uh, asked or requested a breakdown of the data in relation to operational staff injuries and, and certainly disaggregating between what was on the fire ground, so an, an operational incident and what was uh, within a training environment. That information is presented, we'll go through a bit more detail um, for, for yourselves on this occasion, certainly in paragraph 6 which I will I will come back to. But as you can see from the table, 22 injuries have occurred as a result of attendance at operational incidents, uh, and six injuries have occurred during training activities. Worthy of additional note is that of these 28 events, eight resulted in lost time with a, a total loss of 57 shifts being lost due to injuries sustained at operational incidents or training. Uh, this should be viewed in the, uh, in the light of being. Uh, approximately about 100,000 shifts that would be worked during that period as well. So not underplaying the fact that we've lost 57 shifts to, to injury as a result of um, activity on the fire ground or on the training ground, but that is in context with 100,000 shifts being available. But as I say, there's a breakdown of uh, the circumstances of the activity, the number of injuries, the cause, the type, and the days lost to sickness, which is detailed within paragraph six. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions in, in that respect. Yeah, um, Jeff, as you say, a lot of it is lifting. Um, How has that been targeted? Um, <coughs> do they pick up on this and then realise there's a pattern there and, and target it? Or? Yeah, absolutely. This, this information comes back through the, 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 kind of the Health, Safety and Welfare Committee, but there's a number of um, groups that inform the Health, Safety and Welfare Committee and the actions that have been taken, so it's not um, dealt with in, in, in isolation. The very nature of, the, of a firefighter's job um, requires them to, to lift and haul and carry equipment, that's just the, uh, that's just the nature of it. Um, however, we do, uh, on very regular occasions, you know, take them through training in relation to, to manual handling, it's also an incumbent element of all aspects of the training. So if they are doing road traffic you know, uh, extrication work, it will also incorporate a, a, an element of manual handling. If they are working with hose, which has been a number of, it had been a number of the incidents which have been caused through manual handling of hose, that also now incorporates a, an element of, of manual handling within the, within the training. When you leave the work, again, just to extend it beyond just the firefighting role as well, when we've, uh, part of the, the lead up to the bonfire period, we will get a number of staff, not just operational firefighters, but the fire rescue service staff who will be involved in the removal of you know, bonfire material off the streets and so on and so forth. And we would do toolbox talks. So you know, the, the actual workshop staff would have a toolbox talk 
and our manual handling. You know, staff who are going to be part, part of the bonfire removal scheme would have a, a toolbox talk and our manual handling. Um, and, you know, our firefighters, it's, we have specific manual handling training, but we also have it embedded in every single course that we've got to try and mitigate the, the, the impact. But, you know, so unfortunately, you know, the, the nature of a firefighter's role is that on occasions they will be required to carry, lift, haul, and, and you know, and, and extend themselves in that respect. But we are, you know, wrong language, but we are all over it. Yeah. Any questions, comments? Okay, so I think we're also. We have also the agenda item seven, which is page one for now. So yeah, this, uh, this agenda item, as members will be familiar with, it uh, relates to the forward work plan for performance and scrutiny committee. I think we've already identified maybe one specific key area that we would want to uh, refocus on in, in respect of, of health and our health partners and how we can kind of address some of the issues that may be having an impact on ourselves and certainly better understand those issues. But it is again, it's, it's over to yourself, chair and members in respect of you know, items for scrutiny, if there's anything to um, to bring back to the next meeting. One thing I would additionally say is, and some reference has been made to it, there will be a call coming back to the next performance and scrutiny meeting in relation to um, automatic fire alarm actuations and the introduction of our, our revised policy, because again, members uh, identified that as an area that they would want to see the, what the impact has been over the period uh, and I will come back to members uh, for the July meeting. But if there's any other areas that would require scrutiny, um, it's to uh, identify those now and we'll record them as such and bring information to the next performance of scrutiny meeting. Any questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Do we accept that before? Thank you. The next meeting will also be up in the AGM of the conference when we'll update the board. But before we close, can I just say for the minutes, uh, will it be possible that we offer our thanks to Ted Knapp, who obviously didn't get selected 20 years of service.